we're going to have to wait and see what exactly happens. But I think that we're at a uh, uh, really an event horizon where, where um, everything that we have known before is now history, and we're going to be having an entirely new future. And the future is going to be, um, at this point, amorphous. I mean, it's not something that we can define because there are just too many variables. We just know that things are going to change. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, there's, 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 no, there's no denying, denying that. that. Uh, I bring you, I bring on, you for, on for um, affirmation, affirmation is to really, really me saying, me the, saying the, the, same the same thing, thing agreeing with, with you. How many, how many naysayers out there, out there just, just to have their head, have their head in the sand, sand no, saying, no, it's all going to go back to normal. Diamonds clearly hunky dory. Look what they're doing now. And I know that you have very different opinions in that matter as far as everything going back to the to the way the way it is. <laughs> and, so and obviously, obviously that's, the, that's the let me give you one example okay and that i think is it's fairly simplistic and yet at the same time it's indicative of a trend as far as i'm concerned and that is that over the course of just the last two weeks we've seen neiman marcus jc penny and hertz these are all iconic classic american brands all three of them have gone into bankruptcy and the odds that any of them are going to be coming back is i mean maybe jc penny might be able to slim down um but for the most part they have too much debt and uh their day in the sun is over the type of marketing that they represented is done and i think that the same is true with comics business the underlying weakness of new comics at $399, $499, $999, um, you're dealing with such a small number of units relative to what, when I started in the business, a comic that sold under 150000 that was cause for cancellation. Mm -hmm. Now, there are months that go by when we don't have a single issue that hits 150,000. It's not at all unusual. I think the line average for Marvel was maybe 35, 40,000, somewhere in that range, with some titles being published in the 20s. This is unheard of. This is unprecedented in the entire history of the comics world. Why do you think, why do you think that, that, that they're, 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 they're allowing such a, such a, a gap? A gap I mean, why do you, why do you think the standards have been lowered so much? What, 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 do you have any, do you have well, any reason? I don't think standards have been lowered. I think the comics are good. Um, but what you have, and this comes from just classic marketing. They, they talk about the uh, lifespans of industries. And industries begin with innovation, and they begin with your, your new adopters, and, and really cool things start um, gaining traction. And then, at a certain point, they become highly popular, at which point more and more competition enters the marketplace. Then, and this is where we're at right now, that marketplace starts to squeeze out any profitability because people are producing as much or more than what the market can bear and therefore um, the amount of earnings becomes negligible in the overall scheme of things then the last phase the phase that happens before businesses die and i'm thinking toys r us here um is that you have people who come in who are essentially vulture capitalists. They come in, they buy the company, they borrow immense amounts of money against the assets. They upstream as much of that borrowed money as possible to themselves in the form of special dividends, and then they walk away. And uh, what we're seeing in the comics world right now is not nearly so much in the way of the vulture capitalism, but what we are seeing is a very mature market where all the money is in the offshoots now in the, in the films and 
to a certain extent graphic novels and and uh, mass market printed materials um, but the actual core business itself ha is no longer sustaining it has been sustained by a network of what we call direct market comic shops shops that buy direct from the publishers through diamond a single distributor and the problem that you run into is that when you base an entire industry on 3,000 outlets, and that's a stretch. I do not believe that there are actually 3,000 outlets. Uh, mm -hmm. Mile High Comics, for example, constitutes four of Diamond's accounts, um, mm -hmm. even though we're just one store. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have the store account, we have the mail order account, we have the new comic subscription account, and then we have our convention account that we use when we buy stuff when we're doing special events. Um, so with four different accounts, the minute that you start realizing that multiple stores and multiple chain operations uh, are, are counted differently depending on how they uh, allocate things in terms of their billing, there aren't 3,000 comic shops in the nation anymore. And a lot of them are in very expensive retail space because they bought into a concept which I think was extraordinarily ill-advised, which was to convert themselves from being an actual wheeler, dealer, entrepreneurial shop into actually, on many levels, just being a diamond catalog outlet store. Um, I have a, a uh, not so complimentary term that I use, which is bricklayers. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the guys who run a store and act like as if they're comic book dealers, but all they do is every Wednesday they hand somebody a brick. Gotcha. gotcha. No, I know no, exactly, I know exactly what, you what you mean. Um, those um, are those the are stores the stores scrambling, scrambling right because now they because they have they have nothing. To, they've had they've had nothing to, nothing to keep, them, keep going. them going. Yeah, and that was the that was the fallacy, the Achilles heel in that entire premise. The premise was based on the concept that you could use a single source supplier who would deliver damn near everything that you needed in any given week and then you could fill your store up with uh, trade paperbacks and graphic novels and uh, preferably stock up really heavy on things like fanographics so that you could show everyone that you were cultured and had great taste mm -hmm. um, and could be in the avant-garde elite of comic book readers um, note the heavy sarcasm there <laughs> um, noted noted yeah and and in in doing that then you could uh cater to a specific audience but we closed uh the store that we had in lakewood colorado which was our largest new comic store uh 15 months ago best decision i ever made a um, couple of different thoughts there the first one being that we were giving the landlord over $10,000 a month. And we were struggling to make that, that money. Um, and the problem is, is that that store was new comics driven, really new comics driven. And so even though our sales range from maybe 36, 37,000 a month up to as high as 50, 55,000 a month, by the time you factored in unsold copies and that's a critical aspect of this by the time you factor in unsold copies and the rent we were making nothing so our staff got paid not real great but they got paid the landlord got paid diamond got paid slowly the publishers got paid the creators got paid and we got jack shit. yeah and yeah. I really, really hated being in that position, and I am thrilled that I closed that store. But then, but then, this is the second point, and this was, I found this fascinating. This store that I'm sitting in right now is the largest comic book store in the world. It has 45,000 square feet of selling space. It has 10 million different objects in it. 
Yes, yes, and, uh, and this is uh, why this I bring, why you, on I bring you on a creator corner. Normally, normally these creators are reserved, are reserved for, for comic book comic creators, 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 but you have created, created something way beyond, way beyond that. You have that. created, you have created the, 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 largest the largest comic book store in the world, and to, world, me, and to that me, is that is the most fascinating, most fascinating thing. thing. It really, it really is. is. As, as a comic, comic book lover, I appreciate your recognizing that creativity. Um, it's like my pottery collection that I have upstairs. Um, I don't create pottery, but I have a vision of what is really cool aesthetic and sometimes by being a collector an accumulator someone who builds upon the works of others the sum of the parts can sometimes be an enhancement above and beyond what the individual items are and that's what i've tried to do here at jason street is to create this really epic vision of what popular culture can be not just in terms of items for sale but just immersion the idea of, of bringing yourself into an environment where suddenly you realize you're home. That's how I used to feel at San Diego Comic-Con when I went there. Once a year, it was a gathering of the tribes where all of a sudden I felt this kinship with all the people that were at the show. And it was like, oh my God, we're back together again. And I, I used to have a saying in those days that if, if when I died, I did not want to go to heaven because heaven was filled with a bunch of sanctimonious assholes who I really didn't want to be spending eternity with. Um, but I wanted to go to San Diego Comic-Con because that's where all the rascals were. I'm not talking about everybody being, you know, like uh, true fans or anything like that. I'm talking about wheeling and dealing and everybody's arm wrestling, trying to get the best deal, trying to get the coolest comics. But all of us sharing the commonality of really loving the, the medium and what we do. But let me go back to Lakewood. There was that second really critical point. And this was a point that made me realize just how degenerate, really, that bricklaying comic book stores had become. When we finally locked the doors and said, OK, now if you want to get your stuff, you're going to have to go to Jason Street. First of all, we got some measure of resistance, which is a bit odd, but, you know, travel times and convenience and things like that. But then the behavior that I saw manifested blew my mind. You had people who professed to be comic book fans walk into the largest comic book store in the world and simply repeat the exact same behavior that they were repeating at the Lakewood store, which is precisely why the Lakewood store had to close, which is that they would walk in, look at their brick, look at their invoice, sometimes put some more money on their account, and walk out the door. We didn't need a store. We needed a bookmobile, a minivan, mm -hmm. something where people could just come out of the back of, uh, you know, just, just buy it off the tailgate because the amount of actual interest that they had in looking around the store was zero. So what was the point of having a $10,000 a month location in a high traffic shopping center? It was insane. Mm -hmm. And when I opened it, and I opened the Lakewood store um, in May of 1989, when I opened it, it actually was a brilliant concept because the, the Batman movie, the Jack Nicholson Batman, the first one, had just opened. And uh, so having it in that high traffic center with a great parking lot and, and uh, big show windows that we could promote Batman, we had huge crowds in there. But as the store evolved more and more into a diamond catalog outlet, we actually lost that walk-in traffic. People started just walking by the store. And I think you've probably seen this if you've gone by a lot of comic shops. The first thing they do is they wall off their windows with posters, mm -hmm, therefore mm -hmm. creating the comic cave where you can go into, you know, I forget the thing from The Simpsons, the dungeon of whatever in the hell. But mm -hmm. the, the, the bottom line is, is that what you're doing is you're creating this sort of, um, you know, it's like an opium den for uh, people who like graphic literature, mm -hmm. where you all go in and you lay in your little bunks and smoke your, your, your fantasies. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm sorry, but it, that's just horseshit. It's just a waste of time. I like this store so much better because I'm dealing with parents and 
kids. Imagine that. Children. Children coming in here being interested in graphic literature. People coming in here and actually wanting to explore. Yes, find yes. something new. Broaden your goddamn horizons. Kids don't give a shit what just shipped with Diamond last week. Why, they don't. Why, they, they don't give a shit. They want to play with the things that these other brick and mortar, yeah, the brick stores, like you like to call them, don't have. Well, well more importantly, they don't, they don't really know, know what they want. They want. And they're, they're willing to try. They're willing to say, okay, this is an experience that I've never had before. I'm going to give it a shot, and I'm going to see what I can find here. And we see a lot of people who leave having purchased nothing. That doesn't matter to me because this store is about the experience of yes. being in the store, the interactions between parents and kids, the joy that's created, the memories that are created. If we sell stuff, we got to sell enough to cover the cost of being here. Um, but, you know, if it was about money, I'd sell the building, I'd sell all this crap that's in it. Um, I'd never have to work again for the rest of my life. But that's not what it's about. I still have a vision. And my vision is, is that we can turn on a whole new generation to the joys of graphic storytelling. But we have to do that by making the environment pleasant for them, mm. inclusive, so that it doesn't feel like a fanboy opium den. We've got to make it so that people have a good time. They feel like they're respected. They feel like their interests are respected. I mean, I really, I mean, you know, from my own end, there are so many of the genres that I have only a passing knowledge of, but at the same time, I'm not going to disrespect somebody because, well, just to give you a case in point, and this is really extreme, but uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the people that are into anthropomorphic comics, that's even hard for me to say, um, but anthropomorphic comics, um, a lot of them are liked by people who are furries. Um, now, I'm one of the few people around who can say that I have a furry as one of my best friends, okay? And uh, that's a very unusual group of people. I'm not going to disrespect him or the comics that he likes, okay? It's like it's a genre. It's an area. It's like, cool. You know, I can see where that's interesting to you, um, you know, and I've even been to some of their parties, so it's all okay. The world is full of divergence. The world is full of diversity. The world is full of people who have different ideas and different worldviews. Cool. I'm, I'm totally good with that. But when people come in here and all they want is their brick, I just think that's so sad. Yeah. It's like you're not supporting the store, first of all. You may think you are, but you're really not supporting the store. Okay, The store has a vitality. And it needs to have interaction with everybody who comes in here. You know, we, it's, it's a social environment. And I'll grant you, during this whole corona poopy bullshit, um, you know, it's harder. Um, but that's why this weekend, for example, um, we didn't have a sale. Um, I knew I was going to get more than enough people here in the store. Mm -hmm. And actually, I really didn't want to attract a lot of outside people. I wanted it to be mostly us, mostly people that really care and who want to be here and uh, who will hang out for an hour and maybe they'll see something and maybe they won't. But the neat thing is, is that like today, um, uh, Pam bought three collections, Will bought two. So five collections today got purchased. And so this place is not static. It is constantly evolving. There's constantly new stuff in here. But that's because I'm trying to really reach a, an enormous, broad audience of people that are fans of different genres. Having a small neighborhood shop where you're paying 10,000 bucks a month to give people bricks of comics that have such tiny print runs that they're barely being able to continue publishing What's wrong with that picture? Like mm. everything, absolutely everything. And so then you get to the point of saying, all right, so now we got comic shops that are closing. Um, one of my better friends in the industry, um, Lee Hester at Lee's Comics, just bailed. And mm. uh, he had two stores that were probably each doing at least half a million dollars a year. But Palo Alto, the rent is not cheap in Palo Alto. And so he finally decided that he had to get out. 
and someone else decided to pick up his location and that's like turning over the keys to the Titanic. It's like, mm. good on, bro. Have a nice time. See ya. Yeah. So, you know, there's, uh, it's not that I'm hearing of one or two or five or ten comic shops that are either closed already, like San Diego Comics just closed, um, or are seriously thinking about it because the model no longer has any viability. No, uh, but that's that's why I do believe that my, Mile High will be the last to ever close because you don't you you don't abide by that model in any way, shape, or form. No, I mean and that's I and that's why you are the creator. What's know, that's up? That's the thing is that I have no bank debt. Mm -hmm. I sold Fifty Sixth Avenue. It created chaos in here that we're still trying to dig out from under. I got way too much crap piled in here. In actually, even though we have sixty five thousand square feet, it's not enough room for everything that was in 56 because even though 56 was a lot smaller than this place it was packed to the ceiling and mm. uh, so i had to move all that stuff into here shove it in any which way that i could but selling 56 i got 1.6 million dollars out of that and i had no mortgage on that building i just had it was collateralizing our commercial loan for mile high and so I totally paid off Mile High's commercial loan. I have no commercial loan, zero, zip, nothing, nada. So there's 10 million objects in here, and I own them outright. So if you tell me that there's no new comic shipping from now till eternity, it's like, okay, whatever. Um, because my job is to be a transactionalist. I buy from people who need to sell, and then you know, people think that we're a comic book company, but we're really not. We're a sorting company. What mm. we do all day long is take long boxes filled with stuff, and we figure out a way to reposition those objects so that they're accessible when someone comes in who wants it. I mean, you can have 100 Walking Dead number ones, but if you can't find it when the guy who wants to give you $1,000 for it walks in the door, what the hell good is it? And so, um, you know, the good news is this store, and, and I, I didn't plan it this way. Honest God, I didn't. This was just something that happened. This store has been the greatest buying store that I have ever opened in my life. And believe me, over the next 90 days to six months, um, we're already planning that we're going to buy at least a thousand collections because the economic distress that is coming, I think, is going to be profound. Most of the companies that got their PPP money in the first wave have used it up because it's required to be used for payroll and you only have a set amount of time in which to do it. We were able to get some of that money in the second wave and we have four weeks to go. Actually, I think three. But in three weeks, our money will be gone. On July 29th is the magic day. That's when the catastrophe begins. Because on July 29th, there will no longer be any federal subsidy for unemployment benefits. And that $600 a week has been keeping a lot of people alive. It expires on July 29th. And wow. so people that are in really chicken shit states like Florida and Arizona are suddenly going to be going from getting 800 bucks a week to getting 200 bucks a week to live on. And there's how many people that are out of work right now? It's insane. And so we're already anticipating that first off, that our revenues are going to decline and we're going to have to look at our own internal costs and be really, really careful about that. But the second one being that people are going to be burying us in collections. How do we deal with that? If our revenues are declining because our consumer base is having a hard time paying their rent and buying food, somehow we've got to come up with the money to buy collections too. This is. This is going to be an interesting exercise in adroitness. Uh, this is where my skill sets of marketing 
and figuring out ways to make things happen is going to be a real challenge. Um, I'm working on my farm a lot right now because I really believe that come July and August, it's going to become a real struggle for survival. And we're the best position that I know of. What does this say for all the other comic shops? Right, exactly. And it, that's that's you know, why I've been saying, you know, this everything, one says, okay, well, diamond shipping, everything's going back to normal, obviously, even though it's a slow start. And I mean, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you, as, you know, despite the government saying that we can open up and all of that. Uh, I mean, <laughs> there's still, we are going to face an economic crisis. And anybody that doubts that, I think, is just silly minded. So yeah, um, even if diamonds allowed to ship, and there's but there's no one out there that can afford to buy books, that tanks once again. That's going to tank diamond, and I mean that that could in fact end new books because yes, despite DC doing their thing and uh, seeking different avenues, um, I mean it's it's not necessarily catching on uh, with what they're doing, and everyone else seems to be kind of pulling back on that. So. Um, I mean, is this, uh, uh, say in reality, I mean, and it very well could be a reality in a matter of, you know, by the end of the year, there are no new books shipping in print. Um, what, what do you take the industry to be after that? Do you think that, you know, digital thrives or do you think that we start going to places like Penguin and doing, uh, you know, a new book Wednesday is going to be trade paperbacks or, I mean, what, what, where's, where do you stand on that? Well, first off, book day for um, the book industry is Tuesday. And, it is now, yes. And that is why DC is switching over. They are essentially saying this platform is dead. Um, mm. That was their declaration. And uh, they didn't say it in so many words, but actions speak louder than words. Yes, uh, I agree. Now, there's some numbers that I think are very important here. While comic book numbers, periodical comics in particular numbers, have been just awful. Companies like Dark Horse have been printing, and I heard this number and I had to double check it, but it's true, um, on some of the hardcovers that they were printing last year for the book trade, they were printing upwards of a million copies. And these were- Jesus. Yeah. These were books that were um, gaming derived. So they're um, books that are taken off of, off of electronic games. And uh, Dark Horse licensed them and has been creating them for the book market and has been absolutely killing. At the same time, we've seen um, publishers like Scholastic move into young adult graphic novels in a huge way they're killing um and they started this by the way a long time ago when they when they bought the or, or licensed bone from jeff smith all of us at the time this was about 15 years ago maybe even 20 um when when jeff licensed to scholastic we were all aghast because he had been publishing um bone reprints through image and we thought that image was going to be his kind of you know long-term sugar daddy and he walked away from that and turned his his baby over to Scholastic. And it was like, what the hell are you doing? And it turned out to be incredibly prescient on his part because Scholastic runs book fairs. And these book fairs at these schools are tremendously popular and they sell huge quantities of books. And so we've got titles now in the young adult market um, like uh, Dogman that are selling a million copies on initial release. A million wow. copies, okay? That's what we did when, I mean, I remember when Dazzler Number 1 came out and we did 400,000. That was the first direct market book and I helped sponsor that. And uh, so 400,000, these are numbers that make sense, okay? This is when we were all making money. This is pre-Ron Perlman coming in and gutting Marvel, all right? Hmm. We've gone from 400,000 down to 35, 40,000 as a line average. I mean, how low have the mighty fallen? And in the meantime, real publishers are starting to eat our lunch because they're distributing through the book trade, which everybody was writing off as dead 10 years ago. Um, bookstores, new bookstores have become 
um, the primary selling point for graphic literature. I mean, let's, let's be really honest about things here. We have a hubris within the comics world, in the comic book store world, that we are the be-all and the end-all, and that everybody else is a secondary market and a derivative. Um, and somewhere along the line, our arrogance cost us our customers. Um, most of our customers now, for example, um, the largest the largest graphic novel publisher in the United States is Viz. Because manga is the most important genre in graphic storytelling in the United wow. States. Okay? Huh. Uh, Look the wow. numbers up. Okay? We don't sell jack shit for manga. Why? Because those people think we're a bunch of assholes and they don't come in our stores because they see them as being way too male-centric, okay? Huh. And they don't want to come into a place that isn't welcoming of young teen girls, okay, where they don't feel safe, where they're not going to get harassed and leered at, okay? Yeah. So they don't come in here. They go to Barnes & Noble. They order them online. They order them from... Amazon, they order them from Viz themselves. Viz does huge direct marketing. Viz, if you take a look at the top graphic novels sold in the United States, I think they have 15 out of the top 20 spots. We are dead in the water. This marketplace, the comic book direct market store, is filled with arrogant fanboys who believe that they actually have some measure of control over graphic storytelling and over what people are reading, when in point of fact, they lost that control at least a decade ago and it is now being done through mass market merchants who quite frankly are more friendly and smarter than we are. Hmm. And so well. changing how we do things so that we can be more welcoming and then it becomes a difficulty because you're trying to invest working capital. And this is where it comes down to, to business economics. We order uh, Dogman in. And first of all, Diamond, as has always been the case, ships to us after all the other stores have their stuff. So in other words, Diamond takes delivery on a Tuesday, sorts the stuff, and a week later we get it. So we lose that initial sales period. This is exactly how I took over Colorado. I had a distributor here in Colorado, Emil Clausen at Columbine News up in Boulder, who used to give me the comics a week before his own stores. And so I became the leader of comics, new comics, retailing in Colorado in 1974, five, six, because Emil wanted me to succeed, and man, I can't figure out why. Because I was a crazy-ass liberal hippie back then, and he was a John Birch, uh, hate the Russians, commies, bullshit. I mean, he, 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 Emil and I were the exact opposite as human beings, politically, everything, but he liked me. I don't know why. And hmm. Emil used to give me the new comics a week ahead of anyone else in the state. And so, of course, all the fanboys came to me. I had a strategic advantage. Now, if you've got a nine-year-old boy and he's insane for Dogman and Diamond gets it to us 10 days after it's been in Barnes and & Noble and, and King Supers and maybe even Costco, what is wrong with this picture? It's the, we're, we've flipped the strategic advantage. We're the slow and the stupid now. And guess what happened to the slow and the stupid? The slow and the stupid used to be the newsstands, the corner tobacco shops, the candy shops. And guess what? They're dead, Jim. They're gone, functionally obsolete. And guess where we are right now? Yeah. And on many levels, it's because we've been so addicted to sucking on the diamond tit. Mm. No, no, I, uh, I, <laughs> I'm, I. I fully agree, and this is a uh, this is affirmation as to kind of what I've been saying um, to to my listeners for the past few weeks now, because um, you know I actually get the pleasure of uh, hearing you out before all of this um, off microphone. 
But um, yeah, no, hearing it from somebody like yourself, I mean, you, they, but beyond all of that, yes, um, I, I, I guess the answer to the question is trades will probably not be the new Tuesday thing to keep comic book shops alive because well, they, the new bookstores are already taking that. If we were getting them at the same time as all the bookstores were getting them, one of the things right. that's true, and it might require some people to get on the treadmill for a while and actually bitch slap themselves back into their original skill sets. Hmm. Almost all the people that sell comics in comic shops are entrepreneurial. And being entrepreneurial means that you're a risk taker. It means that you're an innovator. It means that you have courage. But everybody got fat and lazy. Yeah. Hey, just buying your shit and laying your bricks. It's just so goddamn easy, but it doesn't actually use the skill sets that you originally brought to the table that made you good at what you were doing. I want to touch on one of those skill sets specifically over the last couple of months and how you have in, uh, made sure that Mile High Comic is, uh, has endured and have given me no doubt that it will continue on as long as you're, you're behind it all. Um, well, you, you used your skill set because you had all of these assets. You've been sitting on all these assets and you, made, you wanted to make sure people were still able to get a good amount of books knowing that the economy is... In, getting ready to be in a not so great state so you 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 and you all of your creativity you put together these mystery boxes that people are loving right now and that's just one of the many things that you know you just it came to you as soon as we had to close the doors you knew exactly what to do. You used your skill sets you, that you've never been hiding. You're constantly doing things. And these are the things that I want other people to, to recognize. And, you know, I like, applaud you as a creator because um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, say it for a second. I firmly believe, Chuck, that you are the most important man still alive in comics right now for what you do to the industry, for what you continue to keep doing into the industry, how you continue to advance it in a, uh, I mean, in, in the ways to make it right without like I said, sucking on Diamond's tit. And that's, uh, I, I mean, I, I personally have to applaud you for that. And your, your creativity during all of this to keeping this place together, keep, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and say, it, making sure that I still had a job during all of this. Um, you do, you use those skill sets. And I've watched so many people roll over and I feel not the least bit of sympathy for them. I really don't because I see firsthand how, how one like yourself can still make things happen. Um, so, I mean, I just got to kind of applaud you for that for a second. I, so, yeah, that's... That's <laughs> that's very kind. I think that, you know, building Mile High has been a constant exercise in risk. And there have been times when, you know, the roll of the dice didn't go well. And uh, so, I mean, there was a point in time about 10 years ago when I was out on the road buying comic collections to try and keep us afloat. And I would be in my cargo van, because we used that. We would fill a cargo van three times with long boxes, and then we would rent a semi and ship those boxes back. And those long boxes, um, I was buying, on a, I, I was, it was one year, uh, this would have been 10 years ago, um, where I spent 300 nights in hotel rooms hmm. out of 365. And the reason for that was because my skills were best utilized for the company as a buyer because there were so many inexpensive comics on the East Coast relative to what I could sell to our worldwide audience through our online that I sacrificed my farm, my home life, everything to live on the road and buy these collections. And I would literally be calling back to Will Murakami and I'd say, dude, I just wrote, you know, a $3,000 check because I got a Spidey one, a Daredevil one, an FF one, and, and uh, you know, 15 other books that'll be out at 20,000, I lay out three, you got to figure out a way to cover it. And, uh, you know, I about killed him. I mean, literally, because he couldn't, um, the, the stress that I can kind of slough off because I've dealt with it my whole life, 
Um, it really eats at other people. But it was so precarious in those days that I can remember um, I would be driving down the road, and yes, I do this, I uh, would be trying to book a, uh, a motel. And I'm not talking about, you know, a Hilton. I'm talking about just, you know, the cheesiest budget motel that I could get, and I wouldn't have enough room on any of my four credit cards to get a $39 hotel room. And there were at least two occasions that I can recall when I called up Nanette at home and had her use her personal credit card to book me a room through Priceline so that I would have a place to sleep that night. And a lot of times it would be really trippy because um, in those days Priceline turned off at 11 at night and so East Coast time. And so if you didn't work it out by then, um, there were no rooms, period. You were screwed. Oh, and I never got to the point to where I actually had to sleep in the van. Um, but it was touch and go. But the point that I'm trying to make is that um, you have to be willing and have the courage to keep innovating and do what you think is right. I would buy a collection at 3 in the afternoon, immediately wrap it up, and I had prepaid labels from FedEx. I would drive over to a FedEx um, office center and I would drop off these long boxes and I would pay 30 or $40 to get that long box back to Will Moulton because I knew that that long box had $10,000 worth of Silver Rage in it and that the odds were really, really good that we would be able to sell those comics. Now, returning full circle, do you know why I was so deeply in debt? At that point in time, I owed about $3.6 million in unfunded liabilities. Wow. All because of unsold new comics. Mm. When I finally started putting the hammer down and saying, we, my top diamond bills, sitting down, ready? The top, I had two bills in a row. One was 62000 and the other was 61000 Those were weekly bills. That's insane. That's, that's absolutely insane. There's no way you're selling. Even as the world's largest comic book store, there's not that many people in Denver coming in there to buy those books. No, and I said we have to get ourselves off this treadmill. This is something is, is insane here. This is, this is truly crazy. And what I found out was that um, even with all the controls that we have, even with all the really good people that were that were implementing those controls, um, we were still eating 20 to 30 percent of all the books that we were getting every week. And how do we eat books? You know, people would order stuff and then their credit card would decline. Mm. And we'd send them a message, hey, your credit card declined. And could you give me, you know, like a new number or something? Never hear back from them again. You not only eat that week's books, but you eat everything that they've ordered for the next two months. And during the Great Recession, 2008 through 2010, um, we lost over a thousand subscribers through our nice system. We lost wow. people in every store, and I think at that point we still had four or five stores. Every store, people that had committed to stuff, we will always require a credit card. But if the credit card's no good, you eat that stuff, and that can drag you under. And so it wasn't that I was doing anything wrong by going out and buying these collections. In, in I mean, I was driving all the way from Florida to Montreal. I was doing these huge runs buying collections, and I was really good at it. I, I, I actually wish I could do it today because I enjoyed the hell out of it. Um, but what I was doing was offsetting our losses from those new comics that we were getting stiffed on. And so, bing, I, the epiphany hit me. The solution is not to keep working harder, 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 harder. The solution is stop buying those goddamn new comics. And so we have now driven it down to where our diamond invoice the week before last was 4100 and our diamond invoice for last week was 4900 
Yeah, that's you a know? giant, uh, that giant dip from sixty-five thousand. You know, and we made our money back with our nice charges on the day the book shipped. Mm. And so at that point, you're not you're guaranteed not to lose. Um, and you just, you know, then you got to try and get yourself through to where it's 100%. But anybody who thinks that I'm going to be ordering tons of books for them on spec, oh, hell no. Because mm -hmm. it used to be, and bear in mind, I created this whole system. Yes, that's run. that's another reason I want to talk to you is because you also created this 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 the system that we abide by now. Yeah, but see, when I was dealing with Emil Clausen, I was paying him fifteen cents for comics I was selling for a quarter. So I was only getting a forty percent discount. But if that book that I bought for fifteen cents didn't sell for a quarter, then I marked it fifty cents as a back issue. Hmm. Gotcha. So instead of making. 40%, I was making triple my money. Mm -hmm. Economics of that are splendid. Today, if you don't sell a three ninety nine comic that you paid $1.67 for, then you put it in your dollar box. So instead yeah, doesn't of make making sense. something, you're losing money on every yep. unsold book, and that's if you can sell it for a dollar. Yep. That's, that's that. if. No. The, the 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 rise in cover prices just literally destroyed the economics. And so mm. it was time for us to back the hell away from the new comics market. And uh, truth be told, when I opened up Jason Street, I swore a vow that we'd never sell new books in this store. Mm. And I had a couple of guys working for me at the time and they whined and they cried and they bitched. And then they whined some more, and then they cried some more. And finally, just to shut them the hell up, I agreed to carry some new books in the store. Sure as shit, we started losing money on them. Man. Cannot. Man. You know, there's... And, and this is the biggest problem that you run into, is that, you know, especially if you have other people doing your ordering for you, they're going to order on the basis of what will make the customers happy. And I'm a huge believer in empathy with the people that, that shop with us. But I'm also a huge believer in discipline. You know, when I see someone get their brick, look at their invoice, open it up, reach inside, hand a comic back to the clerk and say, hey, dude, this book really sucked. I forgot to take it off my list. Um, can you go ahead and take this off my invoice and credit me back? Every time that happens, someone is asking us to pay the price for their lack of diligence. And yeah. I just, I, if I never carried another new book in this store, I would be just fine with that. Not because I don't like new books, not because I don't like the people that read new comics. It's because it's like the most expensive hobby on the planet that gives me absolutely nothing because it is a guarantee to lose money. Yeah. Yeah, no, I understand. I mean, as somebody that really does enjoy new books every week, like myself, I mean, that's a lot of the basis of this podcast is keeping people informed on what's coming out. Um, uh, but, you know, I obviously enjoy the, the old stuff as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's harsh words to hear from you. It is, but at the same time, it's completely understandable. When you put it in an economic sense like that and make it make sense that way, it's, it's completely understandable. And if more and more people start thinking like that, and then we're getting ready to go down this very, very scary time, uh, economically, then, yeah, I think it's, it's more than viable that, this is these could be the last few books shipping out here in the next few weeks and uh, uh it could be here's here's one point that i want to make I, over the last oh, decade or so uh, i've put out at least half a dozen newsletters that i've sent out to all of our customers asking them to take their money and go to their local comic shop and not spend it with us spend it with their local retailer and that sounds insanely counterproductive um, why in the world would I tell them support your local retailer when I'm supposed to be their supplier of choice? Mm -hmm. and the answer is that 
I think that everyone needs to have a certain degree of altruism when it comes to sustaining a community and an industry as a whole. And I think that, you know, it, the folks that are watching this podcast who love new comics need to think about their own culpability in this process. There are no saints or angels walking this earth. Okay, there's mm -hmm. people and people make decisions. Some of them are very self-serving and they don't think about what they're doing and they don't think about the consequences. But I would beg the question, do you want your comic book retailer to survive? If you do, then don't play chicken shit games. Don't be handing them back books and product that you ordered. Don't be letting your credit card decline and don't be a piggy and order more than you can afford. Okay, yes. these are just simple, simple truisms. Comic shops, if they survive this upcoming economic dysfunction that we're going to have, are going to be living on razor thin margins. And these are good people. These are people that are trying to serve a community and who are entrepreneurs and who need not only help, but more importantly, just simple human consideration. Keep your local comic shop in business. Don't be just somebody who buys bricks. Look around the store. It's filled with all kinds of interesting stuff. A lot of it's got dust on it because nobody's looked at it in forever and a day. Why not? It's not yeah, no, it's the new product. When you, when you buy a new product from a store, it's basically a break-even proposition for that store. So if anything else goes bad, like when we had all of our skylights explode and we had hail mm. and rain through the entire store, um, you know, there's no fallback. If, if there's no profitability somewhere, then when things go to hell in a handbasket, then you have no reserves, boom, you're done. And uh, I've spent my whole life building reserves. I have 10 million friends right behind me here. Mm -hmm. They got my back. Okay. I can rely on them. And uh, uh, people, not so much. Um, yeah. People tend to be very self-serving and, and um, not terribly introspective. And they, they just don't see the consequences of their own actions sometimes. And I think that that's critically important. This blossoming of comic shops really started in 1980 so we are exactly 40 years into this whether we're going to get to 50 is a huge question um a lot mm. depends on economic circumstances that none of us can control and definitely it, it involves the publishers but you know you got to look at at dc you know they they stick these these uh, collections with a little bit of new material in walmart and they sell hundreds of thousands of copies yeah. on a non-returnable basis. Why do they want to keep dicking with comic shops? And the answer yeah. is um, they don't. They used to. I mean, when Paul Levitz was there, his commitment to the direct market was unshakable. But swimming in the shark pool at, at Warner, it's not too healthy to stake a position that can be counterproductive to your own career, so they shanked his ass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I have I, I could ask you a thousand questions about this, Chuck. You <laughs> you're so full of knowledge. Um, let's talk about DC for a second. Um, I mean, they uh, they really decided to shake the boat with this, you know, this this, this Tuesday thing. Um, do you really think that is their their way of saying, you know, okay, this is this is the end. Enjoy it while you can, um, because it's uh, <laughs> it really is a big deal how they they, they kind of have the this this very unsure relationship with Diamond right now. Well, you know, DC when when the direct market first started shaking out, and Marvel did their idiotic heroes world thing back in nineteen ninety eight. Mm. Um, DC picked Diamond under Paul Levitt and propped Diamond up and actually had an agreement in principle that was never made public. Well, maybe they did. Maybe Fanographics made it public. I can't remember. Um, but there was an agreement in principle for DC to buy Diamond under certain circumstances. 
And so okay. DC then would have um, had control of the distribution of uh, comics in the United States, much in the way that they did after uh, EC collapsed and the Keith Harper hearings, um, uh, national periodicals, and, and uh, I'm trying to remember the name of their distributor at that time. But anyway, they, they controlled distribution so much that um, they actually dictated how many uh, titles Marvel could print in a month because uh. Uh, uh, they controlled all of Marvel's distribution. So Marvel was uh, allowed eight monthly titles and eight bi-monthly titles. Um, and that's all they were allowed. And uh, that's something most people don't know. Um, and uh, Marvel only broke free of that when the uh, uh, made guys who took over the company um, somehow finagled uh, the distribution company from the Saturday Evening Post uh, uh, out of the ruins of that company and somehow uh, turned it as a part of Cadence Industries. I, to this day, I don't know how that worked. I, I did a case study on it when I was in college, and um, there's just too many unanswered questions. But that incredibly valuable asset, the distribution company, uh, Marvel ended up with it, um, and that was Magazine Management Corporation. And uh, yeah, was, these are just things that happen over a period of time. Where DC is at with this all right now is that I think that the executives at DC and most especially Jim Lee are acutely aware of the fact that print is totally at risk at this particular moment. And uh, so they are no longer bound by conventions. I think Dandia was, was bound by convention. I think that he was still old school. And so he had to go. He had to go because it's no longer going to be business as usual. If print survives, and that's an extraordinary if in DC's case, um, it will be because they bring some big numbers in fast via mass merchants. And so they essentially have made the declaration that we'll still keep producing some material for comic shops, but by golly, you're going to no longer be the driving engine of our business. Um, you are now ancillary to our prime business, and the prime business is dealing with the Amazons and the Walmarts of the world. And uh, if you guys don't like it, um, you know, we don't care. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a harsh that's a harsh thing to kind of that's a harsh pill to swallow, no doubt. But I do, I, I I'm kind of in the same boat. That's how I took all the news. I, that's exactly the way I took it. It's uh, <laughs> we the print is in trouble. Um, I, I mean as it stands now, how do you feel about the digital market? Because right now DC did something last week. They released uh, a 99 cent digital only um, title, and uh, it's. It's really it's based off of what I would imagine is their hottest selling miniseries, this deceased. So they're using a big cash crop and saying, if you want to read this story, which you know is going to be good, you have to read it digitally. Um, I mean, do you th do you think that's further affirmation as to where they're going about in all this and trying to you know appease bookshelves, not necessarily comic racks? I think actually I think it's reflective of something much greater in AT and T because they took on an immense amount of debt in order to buy Time Warner, and they don't have coverage on that debt anymore. And mm. uh, I think that the odds that AT&T itself is going to go bankrupt are pretty high, um, because they no longer have the sales volume to service the debt that they had to take on um, to pay the really high premium that they did for Time Warner. So if you've got senior management at a holding company that is above Time Warner that are sweating bullets about whether they're going to be able to keep their own jobs, they're going to throw anything and everything under the bus. They don't care. Now, digital was supposed to be the hot new thing um, 10 years ago. And I actually was flown out to uh, Burbank and uh, participated in a thing with Jim Lee and Dan and a bunch of other retailers. And uh, we talked about uh, digital platforms and what could possibly happen. Um, they ended up ignoring pretty much everything that we said. They went forward, and it's been 
on many levels a resounding failure. And the primary reason seems to be because that all they've really ever offered is backlist. Um, so there's been this bias against putting original material that you could only get online um, via the DC platform or the Marvel. Um, I think right now, desperation is driving uh, them to basically experiment. And I don't know whether this is going to be successful or not. Clearly, there have been a lot of small press projects that have been digital only in the beginning, and then some of them have found uh, print, either either reprints or, or uh, trade paperbacks later on. Oh, sure. And uh, so I see it not as an act of malice or volition, nearly so much as an act of desperation. Um, you know, Jim Lee doesn't want to be fired. And when they take the person sitting in the chair across from you and they walk him out the door, that has a chilling effect. Mm. And Jim is a really smart guy, and he's swimming in a pool filled with sharks who are starving to death. What's he going to do? Yeah, no, and he's rocking the boat. Want. Okay. Yeah. It's no longer, I mean, from from the very top of AT&T all the way through the entire structure, right now it is terror, absolute terror. And so what do you expect? Yeah, there's going to be all kinds of crazy shit that's going to happen. And uh, how it's all going to shake out, boy, none of us are smart enough to know that because it's just yeah. too much. The macroeconomics are, are, are impossible for any of us to define. You know, the, there are people out there right now saying that this is going to be a V-shaped recession and that the third quarter is going to be magnificent. And then there are people who are saying that all of this lack of social distancing is going to turn around and blow the virus right back up again and that the third quarter is going to see a new shutdown, um, in which case, oh, my God, the economic damage then will be we do throw all the people that are that are um, susceptible to the disease, most likely to have it. Are we going to throw all of our elderly under the bus? I mean, is this Germany 1933? where we're going to have state-sponsored euthanasia, where we're essentially going to say, okay, all you old and decrepit people and you people who have underlying health conditions, you're going to have to die for the sake of the fatherland. It's effectively what, what's being put forth right now. And uh, I find that intensely disturbing. Not just that there are insane leadership that are putting this forward, but that I'm hearing so many people who are buying into this Kool-Aid, that is the minute that you cross that ethical line and you say that some lives are disposable, that's insane. So yeah. um, I don't know where this is going to go. I know that I have lots of resources and assets. And I have, I think, the most important thing of all, which is a, a, a real caring and empathy for the people that shop with us. I want to try and help. I mean, the people that aren't going to get new comics, I'm going to do my best to turn them on for older stuff, things that are coming out, things that they may have missed. Um, one of the things that's been absolutely true is that during the entire pandemic, streaming has become an immense success. And uh, the problem with that is that there's only a finite amount of content. And mm. so um, after people have been locked in their houses for 100 days, um, they start running out of things to watch. Um, but there's always graphic novels. There's always comics. There's really amazing, cool stuff out there. We are blessed to have the greatest accumulation of entertainment literature in the world. And so what we need to do, and our job, is to connect people's passions with those objects, those books, those those magazines, those comics that most appeal to them and to make them happy. If your goal when you come into the store is to make other people happy, 
if that's what gets you excited and gets you happy, then you're in the right business. Because yeah. we're supposed to do, um, but we're supposed to do it on the basis of knowledge. We're supposed to do it on the basis of empathy, and we're supposed to do it on the basis of caring. Yeah, no, I I, I I agree, and that's that's what attracted me to Mile High Comics, and um, I can. Once again, I guess I'm going to kind of gush here. I don't know if I would be talking to you on a microphone right now officially if it wasn't for Mile High Comics and the way I was brought in. Because of how I walked into the Lakewood store and how Dave greeted me. And Dave said, I, I remember it was Farmhand that came out that hit the shelves. I was just starting my pull list. Farmhand came out and Dave said, oh, you haven't read Chew. And then I found Chew. And then I found this whole other world of comics that I didn't even know about. And from that point on, I dedicated my entire life to making sure that anybody that crossed my path, more than likely, I'm going to introduce you to a comic book. I mean, that's just what it is. I'm going to bring up comic books. Yeah. And it was all because of that interaction that I had walking into the Lakewood store. But see, that's, that's where a great retailer, and Dave is a great retailer, when you have a great retailer, they make a connection. They figure out what it is that makes their fans happy and that's the key to everything except and this is the big except then you got to figure out a way to keep it disciplined enough to where you're making money because if you buy a hundred copies of farmhand but you sell eight you're screwed um yeah you know one of my one of my best friends rory um had this this store out in um, California and San Francisco called the best of two worlds or no comics relief comics relief take it back um, his comics relief store was okay and this is where you have to understand the dichotomy okay I thought that that comics relief store was one of the very best comic book stores that I had ever seen in my life and one of the worst businesses because he Rory could not say no to some of the most god-awful crap self-published little I mean an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper with four crayon marks on it Roy take ten okay and his entire store when he went out of business was filled with all of these small press doodle books that no one in their right mind was wanting to buy we buy things from small press people here at Mile High. I actively sure. support small press, but we do have a standard, okay? Right. It has to at least be reasonably well done. And we're all really lucky because we have Bob Conway here in town, and he's become the best small press comic book printer, I think, in the nation. And uh, so uh, lots and lots of people are, are printing their comics here in Denver now. And uh, so Bob's business actually through the recession actually picked up um, because a lot of a lot of the uh, uh, self-published people here in town were using his services. And so we have books with nice production values and uh, maybe they're on an offbeat title or genre or, or whatever. Um, and we're happy to support that. But you can't have a comic shop where um, you're so anxious to proselytize whatever it is that you think is great um then that you end up tying up all your working capital um when will and i go to visit new comic shops the first thing we do is we go to their new comic rack and if they have a stack like this of uh, a given title that came out a week ago it's like okay dead store welcome because they they, they already are not going to be making a cent and so the first time something bad happens to them, they're going to lose all their working capital. They won't be able to pay diamond and boom, they're done. And, yeah. uh, you know, the, the thing to bear in mind is that I've watched 20,000 stores fail. Hmm. I yeah. I mean, in 50 years time, time, that's, that's, that's a huge number. That's a, well, huge, that's number. a huge number, but it's not a huge number over 40 years. It's 500 a year. And maybe we had some bigger years. 93, 94 was a really bad year. 2009 was a really bad year. But, but you know, over, over 40 years, having 500 shops a year fold, um, maybe that's a little more than a normal marketplace. But uh, uh, something that almost no one who, who 
and inherits money from granny um, ever figures out is that 90% um, of new businesses fold within five years. Mm. And so you get that statistic from the Small Business Administration. They'll hand you the little booklet. It's a federal booklet, okay, so it must be true. Um, and it, and it, it, it just says, you know, that, that, you know, for a business like mine to be under the same ownership for 50 years is less than one-tenth of one percent possibility. Um, all businesses are moments in time. They're like a flower that blooms. You can't expect a flower to bloom forever. It blooms, it's a moment, it's a, it's a, a moment in time of great beauty, and then it goes. And so we've seen comic shops that have been magnificent. Um, and uh, uh, when they opened up, everybody thought they were the greatest thing. Um, and I can think back now to, to comic shops that were the trendsetters, the defining comic shops. They're gone. <coughs> everything has a moment in time. Everything, everything exists. And so uh, the, the reason I'm saying this is because I'll just reiterate Fans who love their comic book dealer need to be aware of the economics. They need to try and keep their store in business so when the next greatest thing comes along that they have someone to tell them about it. And, you know, maybe it's less true today because people are in chat rooms and they got the Internet and they, they can go and they can look at this and they can look at that. Um, but it's still true that um, the guy that's putting his money on the line and ordering the product is the one that's really going to be trying to, to steer you in the right direction. He needs you. No. He really, really, every comic book store in the country needs their fans because without them, they, they go out. But the number one reason they go out is because they owe money to Diamond. Yeah. Diamond is... is the beginning and the end of most comic book retailers' existence. And by the way, the reason I mentioned Granny's money is because I cannot even count. I mean, if I took off my shoes, I couldn't count. How many people I have run into who inherited money and pissed it down the comic book store rat hole? Yeah, okay. and uh, I, I... People have this I, crazy notion, and I'm, I'm just going to make this one point. For someone who loves comic books to believe that they can run a comic shop is like an alcoholic saying they can run a liquor store. Okay? Get your head around that one for a minute. Because you love the product does not make you a businessman, does not make you an entrepreneur, does not mean you can balance a checkbook, does not mean that you can deal with the, the tax forms. It, there are skill sets involved in being a comic book retailer that have absolutely nothing to do with liking comic books. First and foremost, you have to be a business person. You have to have, be a risk taker. You have to be a hard worker because many yes. times, and I will guarantee you this, there have been many times when only because I put in a lot of extra effort, we were hanging on by our fingertips many times. I, I, people talk about the fact that I found the huge Mile High collection back in 1977, and I and and they say, oh, that well, that was the be all and the end all of Mile High comics, and that's why you have 10 million comics today. And you know that is the biggest bunch of horse bucky, because there have been more than a dozen times when we have redlined to the point to where I thought we were going out. And I have somehow managed to figure out some way to weasel my way back from the apocalypse and, and to not fall into the endless abyss. And you got to understand, I'm Chuck Rosansky. If other people fail, it's a momentary ripple in the force and nobody really cares. But if Mile High Comics were to go out, that would make a difference in a lot of people's lives. I've sold $200 million worth of comics over my career to well over a million people around the planet. And I've been stopped on the street in Europe by people who, who 
recognize me from my innumerable postings and newsletters and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the bottom line is, is that it's my responsibility at this point in my life to try and set a standard and to try and speak the truth and to try and make sure that there's some candor to the discussions so that we're not just walking into the fog here without at least some clue as to the risks that are that are in front of us. This may all blow over. This may all turn out to be hunky-dory. But the underlying economics of our business are bad right now. They were bad going into the pandemic. The pandemic has, has seriously hurt a lot of stores, particularly the smaller ones that can't maintain social distancing. They're having a heck of a time right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's no product to sell. With the limited uh, uh, new comic releases that are coming out now, um, if you're a if you're a store that sells bricks and your bricks are this big, what are you going to pay the rent with? That ten thousand bucks a month that you paid, you signed up for, and you know there, Lakewood. I will tell you a story about Lakewood. In Lakewood, um, they took me to court because we were four months behind on the rent. I'm pretty good at this. Okay, so I managed to weasel my way out, um, and it really was a weasel. Trust me on this one, and I'll tell you what a weasel is. Um, they took me to court. They wanted all their money. Now, this is something that's true about leases, and, and you know, your, your, your viewers may or may not know this, so if you're ever signing a lease, pay attention, okay? Um, when you sign a commercial lease, it has an acceleration clause in it. And the acceleration clause is that if you are in default, then they can demand the all the payments for the duration of the lease in a lump sum. And if you don't pay it, then there are statutory penalties that go on top of that, and they can seize everything in the store to begin with, but then that's not the end of it. Then they can go after your house, your car, any assets that you have. So in the case of Lakewood, um, they were trying to ding me for two hundred grand. Jesus, two hundred thousand dollars cash on the barrel head. Jesus, but there's a trick, and the trick is is that we're an S corporation, not a C corporation. Or excuse me, we're a C corporation, not an S corporation. S corporations are pass-through corporations where um, the, the individual and the entity file together. Um, it's sort of like an LLC. Um, but a C corp is a legal entity that exists in and of itself. I went to court and represented Mile High Comics, and the judge said. You can't do that because a corporation, by law, has to be represented by an attorney. Well, yeah, I knew that. But what it did was it gave me a 90-day continuance. So I worked out a deal in the hallway to give eight five thousand $5,000 checks over eight weeks, and I covered the forty grand that we owed in bank rent, and I got out of it. But why did I get out of it? Because I knew a trick, okay? And the trick was that the judge could not move forward by law without me having representation or Mile High Comics having representation, and I was not qualified to represent. So I filed my continuance or my my uh, uh, response. Um, 15 minutes before the trial, before the, the judgment was supposed to begin. Okay, this is shit that you learn the hard way, okay? You learn it over years of experience. But when, when I say that comic book stores hang on by their fingertips, sometimes the entire company can turn on those kinds of seemingly minor moments. And that's why I tell comic book fans, 
do not assume for a moment that your store is stable or that it's going to be there tomorrow unless you do something. You have to be proactive. You have to help your retailer because, you know, if, if somebody, and this happened, our next door neighbor when we had the store at the Westminster Mall had a, uh, an independent bookstore. And uh, the guy that owned that mall, um, well, I'm hoping is dead, but I'm not sure. Um, he let her fall behind in the rent. And I mean let her. She was, he, she wanted to close the store, and he said, no, nah, you can turn this around. Hang on for a while. Well, she finally got nine months behind on the rent, and goddamn if he didn't sue her and take her house. Uh. She was a flight attendant at United Airlines, or uh, not a flight attendant, uh, gate, gate agent at United Airlines for her day job, and then ran this little bookstore on the side. But I've actually watched people um, lose their homes over commercial leases that were accelerated. Um, so this is not a hypothetical. And so um, if you get an inheritance from granny and you think about opening up a comic shop and you go wandering over to the local strip mall and you sign on the dotted line, bear in mind that if you fall behind, they can accelerate that and take everything. And so wow. these are the kinds of things I like to try and make when people come to me and they, and they say, Oh my God, I've always wanted to own a funny bookstore. Da, 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 da. It's like, are you an idiot? Are you okay? Tell mm -hmm. me about how, how many business classes you've taken. Tell me how long you've worked in flea markets. Tell me how much entrepreneurial experience you have. I mean, before I opened the first mile high comic store, I sold at conventions and I sold at flea markets and I'm, Man, some of the flea markets that I sold at, I mean, you know, out of dog tracks and, and standing there all day in the sun and hoping that, that my plastic bags didn't melt. And, you know, I mean, just you have to pay your dues, okay? You don't just take granny's money and go running over and open up a comic shop. That's in this market. That's you and granny's money are about to part ways. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's great advice because I mean that's, I hear it all too often. You know, being at Mile High Comics as much as I am, I hear people say, "Oh, I'd love to oh, do something like this one day." And um, no, these are these are the people that should be listening to the the words right from your mouth, Chuck. Because I mean, it's <laughs> uh, you're... That, I, that I that I don't want competition, and and you know, at this point in my life, I could give a rat's ass. I really could. I don't. Care. Well, we are anybody on that thinks level, and so. I have nothing to lose by being completely forthright with people and just saying, you know, and I wrote a hundred and, oh my God, 70 columns, I think it was, for the Comics Buyer's Guide about 10 years ago. And all of them are completely valid today, pretty much. Um, I wrote the history of the Mile High 1 collection, the Mile High 2 collection, and I wrote a six-part series on So You Want to Be a Comic Book Retailer. Mm -hmm. Anybody who is even thinking about that, especially in this environment, I mean, you've got to be a moron. But whatever. Um, first, start by reading those. Um, I've actually had um, a bunch of people um, who have come to me after reading those and then taking the plunge who uh, have come up to me at shows and thanked me and said, um, you know, I didn't agree with everything that, that, that you wrote, but you opened my eyes and you made me think. And by making me think, I think it, it helped me in getting over that initial hump and surviving that, that initial craziness that otherwise might have dragged me under. And uh, so those, I, I, I highly recommend those columns. Um, we still get fan mail on those. And uh, the 17 part Mile High One uh, Edgar Church collection story is the single most popular story that I've ever written. Um, I think it's, I, I'm, I'm just guessing here, but it, it's easily had a hundred thousand reads. Um, and they could all find this stuff on uh, milehighcomics.com under what is it? Tales from the database, right? You have a lot of this stuff published under the column. Yeah, those were, those were great times because it was me and Peter David and just all sorts of people that were um, writing for the comics buyer's guide. And it was, it was a really interesting and vibrant period. Um, which all went crashing down when they told it. Um, because the guy, 
And and I thought this guy was so smart. Chet Krause owned Krause Publications. And uh, one day he woke up and he felt the winds shifting. And he said, I'm done. And he sold the whole thing um, to this magazine group. And uh, it sure seemed like one of those, you know, when you're in business school where they say, this was a nice positional transaction where they found things that meshed really nicely. They got Antiques Trader. They got all these different things that dealt. Uh, there was a coin magazine, a stamp magazine, a comics magazine, Antiques magazine, all these different specialty publications um, that Jack Krause had put together. And, man, he left those fools high and dry because he took the money and ran and uh, they started immediately realizing that they had to fold some of these turkeys and uh, Comics Buyer's Guide was one of them and that's when I knew that the comics industry as we knew it was dead. It was over. Um, because Comics Buyer's Guide was the weekly newspaper. Weekly. Every week we got at, at its peak um, it was running 60 pages a week of ads filled with back issues, you know, golden age, old radio shows, movie posters, all this different kind of stuff. Um, and it lasted 1,670 issues, I think it was. And uh, when they finally, first they converted it to a magazine, and uh, that went for, I think, two years. And then they said, screw it, we're just done. And Maggie Thompson was the editor-in-chief, and Maggie is brilliant. But when you have the most brilliant minds in the comics industry producing great editorial and then it's filled with cool shit that you could buy um, that's coming out two weeks after the same stuff was available on the internet you're dead yeah. and so I've watched all sorts of things come and go by the way they did a survey one time and I found this really interesting they had 20,000 readers and they figured out that their um, average reader had fifteen to twenty thousand comics in their closet. Wow, that's that's a big number. That's a big number because I'm looking at my closet right now, knowing what I have, and you know I'm just multiplying that, <laughs> and that's that, that's a big number. Well, the average reader had 50, 50 to seventy five long boxes. Okay. Wow. But you got to think this through. This was 20 years ago. Cover price then was, I think, $1.75, 2 bucks, something like that. But the majority of those comics were purchased by people who were buying them for $0.35, cents, $0.50, cents, $0.60, cents, $0.75, cents, a dollar. You know, in those days, bricks were really bricks. People would come in, and, and sometimes they would get 40 and 50 books a week. But two things happened. One, nobody could keep up with the output and read them all. Nobody had enough free time. That was one problem. Um, and then the second problem was that Ron Perlman bought Marvel and started jacking up the prices, and, and uh, uh, it became too expensive to buy comics. Um, but in the early days, when, when we were all buying comics back in the 70s and the 80s, they were inexpensive. And so you went into the store, and you came out with a big old stack, and it cost you 10 bucks. Uh. Yeah, um, you know, and that's I, I can say that my my first experience buying comics was very similar to that because uh, uh, what was it was Hastings was going out of business and they were doing a ninety percent <laughs> off sale. So I walked out, Chuck, with a stack like this, and I, it was like eighteen bucks. I was like, "This is I this is awesome." That was my my first, and that was my introduction. And it was it, obviously it's never been like that since. But I so I I do kind of I was able to experience that in some way, shape, or form thanks to Hastings' failure. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, no, I I, 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 I get that about Hastings' failure because in the comics world we have had these extraordinarily arrogant people that have come into the business that I call soups. They're people that come in with their MBAs and their consulting degrees and they think that they walk on water. And I had folks from that world who told me 30 years ago that I was a dinosaur and that 
I should just dry up and blow away. And every single one of them has failed and folded. Um, you know, the biggest, if you want to, the record for the, for the biggest fold, um, if you ever uh, see some comics that were called techno comics, yeah, they burned through $18 million in a year. Trying Jesus. to put out, uh, you know, William Shatner's Tech World and all these, all this shit. Um, and uh, uh, Nerd Nimoy's Prime Mortals. And, uh, they were going to do um, mall kiosks and sell comics out of mall kiosks. And, um, you know, uh, I have watched... I'm trying to think of all the money. I mean, it's, it's just hard to get my head around it. Um, I probably watched a hundred million dollars get pissed away um, by people who have who have come into this business thinking that they were going to um, take it by storm. They don't ever bother to try to understand the fundamentals, and most importantly, they don't give a rat's ass about the consumer. To them, it's just all about moving widgets. And if you don't care about fans, if you don't really empathize with them and want to provide them with really good stuff that's going to entertain them and maybe even enlighten them a little bit, um, then you're in the wrong business because this is a very, um, this is a very different business. It's not about witches, and it's the reason why I got into it in the first place. I could have gone and and you know done stock options and made a lot of money. Um, but that's just not me. This is this is me, and I've been very happy with this. And uh, I don't have any grand ambitions except that we keep the store open so that when those parents and kids come in, that they are enriched and that their lives are better for it. And so I think that's what we all need to try and do. I and I, I I admire that, and that's that's why I was immediately attracted to Mile High Comics. As soon as I mean, I'm I'm grateful. This was my introduction in, into a comic book store. It was the Lakewood store, and then it came over, and then before I knew it, I I was, I mean, I'm employed there now. This is <laughs> I loved it so much. I just had to make sure that I was there as much as I can, well, I, well, be I mean, there as much as I can. I mean, we have lots and lots of stuff here, but we have to work as a team try and make sure that it gets into the hands of people who will appreciate it. Um, you know, I don't sit on all of these comics because I want to somehow take them to my grave. I sit on these comics because I'm their guardian. I'm, I'm safeguarding them. And, and, you know, when the time comes and people come to appreciate whatever they are, like I'm looking across the room right now and I see a stack of um, old uh, BC and Peanuts. Um, paperbacks, the old Crest Fawcett signet paperbacks. And uh, right now, you can still find them in used bookstores and stuff. And there's a small market for them. But 20 years from now, where are you going to get them? And so I'm a very patient person, and I have immense amounts of storage space. And I'm intending to fill it right up to the ceiling. You know, if I have one, one kind of grand ambition, it's to put a second floor in this building and uh, then fill it with more stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, but the purpose of that is that when someone discovers uh, BC or the Wizard of It or Peanuts or whatever, we'll have stuff to, to make them happy. And uh, that's a good thing. Yeah, you definitely have plenty of stuff. I mean, you have, that that stuff got mile high through the the Corona crisis when you were forced to lock the doors too. You know those uh those mystery boxes they they went over well, and that was because well, you did. had stuff. But the big thing is, I mean, we, I mean, the mystery boxes, we sold a couple thousand of them, and it was hellish trying to to get them all pulled. But the <laughs> big thing is, and and uh, 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 John McPhee wrote a book called Giving Good Weight. And it's all about how the key to uh, retailing of almost any kind is to keep people more than they expect. And uh, the thing about the mystery boxes is what made them hard to do was that I had to find really good comics to put into them, but ones where I wasn't like cutting my own throat by giving up stuff that we might need a year from now to fill an order. 
Um, so identifying the ones that we could afford to give up, but then giving really great weight. Um, you know, our five pound mystery boxes more often than not were seven or eight pounds. And I tried mm -hmm. to throw a, a, a trade paperback into each one. And uh, I didn't have to do that. Um, but at the end of the day, people were stuck in their houses. People were unhappy, miserable in many instances. And I had a chance to make a couple thousand people really happy with what they received, way giving them way more than what was anticipated. And there are some things in this world that are way more important than money. And uh, so that's what I tried to do. And uh, it worked out really well, and it did generate some cash flow for us. It helped keep us in business, but um, since we were paying 12 bucks shipping out of every box we sold, um, that shipping cost kind of really ate a lot of the revenues away. Um, but it didn't matter. I, uh, this was not an exercise in making money nearly so much as it was an exercise in trying to utilize an underutilized asset of ours to create happiness and to try and mitigate in some small measure the uh, the impact of the coronavirus. I mean, I kind of view it, and this is a strange analogy, but just go with me. Um, I, I feed starving people out on the street, and uh, I know that I can't feed everyone, and sometimes it's emotionally wrecking to be out there because um, I'm passing out food and I'll run out and I'll have someone um, who's in a wheelchair or, or a, a lady in her 70s um, with a walker and I won't have anything left to give them. And it's just devastating to have to drive away knowing that that person is not going to eat tonight. Um, the only way you can rationalize that is by saying, I. I couldn't make a difference in their lives, but I made a difference in the lives of all the people who I did help. And so it was the same way with the mystery boxes. Um, there's no way that I could convince everyone in the world that these mystery boxes were an exercise in altruism, but on many levels they really were, because it was my way of trying to help as many comic fans as I could within the recognition that if I sold too many, we wouldn't be able to fill them. And so it was it was kind of treading a line, but we did successfully send out at least 2,000 of those boxes, and it was a good thing. And now that things have opened up, they're kind of superfluous. Now people don't really need them at this point, because in most states in the nation now, they, people can get to comic shops again, and that's a good thing. Um, I'm perfectly happy to wind down this operation until if the second wave hits, um, yeah, then we're going to have another whole exercise to go through. But none of us know if that's going to happen, so we just got to wait and see. Right. Well, thankfully, you do have the the assets to provide a second wave, and that's and that's why I I mean, <laughs> I applaud the fact that Mile and I I stand by the fact that Mile High Comics will be the last remaining comic book standing when it all when it's all said and done because like I said, like you said it's not a comic book store as much as it is a sorting facility as well. Oh yeah. So I mean, and you you have plenty of stuff to keep us sorting. That's for sure. Um, uh, but you know what the biggest challenge is. Tell me. And this, this is really hard because when you empathize with people and yet you're looking at economic harshness and reality, it's really hard to figure out a way to find a path that works. But I am almost certain that come the first week of August, we're going to be seeing 20, 30, 40 people a day driving up to the store wanting to sell their collection. And we're not going to have the revenues to be able to pay anything like what we paid before. Hmm. But these are going to be people who need food money, who need car payment money, who need rent money. And I'm already thinking in terms of how do I deal with this? I'm not going in debt. I'm not going to borrow money. 
whatever we have in the till, that's it. If we if we're not making any monies, then then we're not going to be buying stuff. But in the worst of times, back in the um, Great Recession, 2008, 2009, 2010, we actually got to the point to where we stopped buying. And we actually had to tell people just flat out, I'm sorry, but we have no money to buy any collections. Well, when you know that you're the funding of last resort for a lot of people, that they're finally going to sell old yeller because they need the money and they come to you and either you say I'm giving you 20% or, or I can afford to give you 20% of what I would have given you a year ago or I can't give you anything at all how do you sleep at night how do you rationalize that knowing that you're crushing people's last hope those are mm. that's the big challenge that I see coming up in the future and if the whole uh, economic uh, decline that we're projecting turns out to be incorrect then that's a moot point then it then it's not a big deal but I actually care about these things I care about the people not just the people that's that, that buy from us but also the people that sell to us and the idea that we're going to be less than we want to be for these folks that we can help less um geez that to me is is the nightmare that i'm looking at going down the road that really worries me the most um i do think and and you know for those who are longtime collectors out there who are thinking about the value of their own collections i think that this will be a a, a temporary kind of a situation i believe in the long term of the market I think that, that uh, you know five years ten years down the road uh, comics collecting is going to be way bigger than it is today especially if all the young kids that we see coming in here now are any indication oh my god we have a great future in front of us we may not be happy because Walmart selling 500,000 copies of a DC book but god damn that's 500,000 people that aren't going into comic shops that are reading comics so we got to recognize that there is a future ahead of us. But man, these next six months could just be a bitch. It could be just, just gut wrenching, because I know that I'll eat. I know that my rent's paid. I know that I'll I'll keep the lights on. Um, but how much will I have left over in order to to give to people who who are also going to be needing? And I I don't right. know. I'll guarantee. I don't think there's going to be another comic shop. I <laughs> I think that it, any negative impact that we feel is going to be felt equally by a lot of other people. Yeah, no, I, uh, I'm, pr I'm probably even more, uh, to be honest. It's, uh, oh, man, it's, it's, it's scary times. It really is. It really is. But these are, these are things that I p think people need to realize. Uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be so harsh if it. I'm hoping it is an if and not a when. Um, if it does become a reality and you know, hearing it from somebody like yourself because you're not the guy that just inherited gran grannies whatever and opened up the kiosk you have more um, say in this business than I'd say just about anyone else out there and that's why I do really stand by the fact that you're probably the most important man alive still in comics um, so hearing it from you it's uh, it's scary, but at the same time, you do say that there is a silver lining to it all down the road with the the fact that collectability could spark up with the next generation, and that's one thing where you are, you have the stuff, uh, and you know it's say there is never a, a book printed again at this point. You know, printed comics become a relic. You know, it's a, they're an antique, even even if they were just printed last year. Uh, there's nothing, I mean, eventually, you know, if we do hit an economic slide, uh, more than likely it will bounce back, no matter how long it takes, eventually it probably will bounce back. And if that's the case, then you're, I mean, comic book owners, uh, and not store owners, just comic book owners in general, are, I believe, are going to be sitting on a mountain of gold. Uh, yeah. to, to the people no, I, that have I just been seen. Agree. Yeah, I think that um, 
to a certain extent, there, it's that old expression about familiarity breeds contempt. I think the fact that there have been too many comics in the marketplace, because I, I did the numbers at one point, and uh, I think it's actually higher than this now, but at one point I figured out that there had been two billion comics printed and sold through the direct market. Wow. All of those comics have to transact at some point in time because people die, people get divorced, people move. There's any number of reasons why people, but what was happening for a period of time was that in the secondary market, eBay, uh, Craigslist, flea markets, whatever, um, there were a hundred million or more comics that were for sale at any given moment in time that people oftentimes were desperate to get rid of. Well, if there aren't as many periodical comics being printed, and, and I'm not saying that periodicals won't exist, but I'm saying that the, going down the road, I think it's going to be a hybrid between um, uh, trade paperback originals that are being done, which is essentially a, a, like binge watching a, t uh, a, a streaming show. Um, but be that as it may, uh, there's going to be comics. There's going to be digital comics. There's going to be graphic novels. There's going to graphic literature, graphic storytelling is not going to go away. And um, this old format, the, the periodicals format, may indeed uh, subside and, and to, the, to a great extent go by the wayside. Um, but at least for small press creators, it is the cheapest and simplest way to reach people. Um, you know, if you can go to Bob Conway and he can print you your, your very own comic book, print a thousand or two thousand copies, um, then you can flog those until you're 86 years old. Um, but be that as it may, um, your entry cost is really low and your risk is really low. So I think it's a medium that's can, can, can uh, I think there's forests in Canada that we still are going to slay in order to put graphic literature out there. Um, but for people who are sitting on comics today, um, yeah, every day that goes by, there's a fire, there's a flood, tornado, whatever comics get destroyed by the day and so it's a diminishing function the minute that they stop making as many new comics there will be more old comics that get destroyed through happenstance and suddenly all of a sudden you turn around and you know there's no more big little books there's no more pulp magazines there's no more of the um, dime novels that used to sell in the millions um, everything eventually gets destroyed. And so the more that you can safeguard something which no longer is being made, um, the greater a likelihood that you have a store of value for the future. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, yeah, it's, it's nice hearing that come from you because this is something that I just kind of speculated on myself. But knowing that, you know, you agree with that, it's... Uh, uh, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Because I, I kind of, I, I take pages out of your book when it comes to to, to collecting as well. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of getting rid of the books, but at the same time, I also recognize the fact that other people need to be able to experience it as well. Um, but uh, the if that never happens and I just hang on to it, I also, I'm not, I'm not mad at that either. Because I, I just like you said, every day that book just becomes slightly more rare in some way. And, I mean, there's that chance, and uh, I. I love history, particularly comic book history, and that's that's how I look at these. I look at every back issue out there as a piece of history. Um, may, not very old history a lot of times, but yeah, that, that's that's just the level I appreciate this medium. Well, it's, so It's grist for another um, broadcast. We can't cover it today. But, <laughs> um, I view comics slightly differently because for me, every comic book, damn near, um, is a memory trigger because I knew the people who made them, I knew the publishers, I knew the distributors, I knew a lot of the retailers who sold them. And so you can hand me any given comic. One of the first things I do is I go to look at the ads because um, I want to see who was advertising at that point in time. Um, but, you know, that's just me. I, uh, the comics world, the environment, the community is what's always been most important to me. Um, you know, I haven't read new comics avidly in 30 years and uh, I've still managed to sell more of them than anybody alive <laughs> um, so it's not that I uh, treat them as a commodity by enemies but rather 
that I think what's most important is understanding the people that you're selling to and what their needs are and then bending over backwards to try and meet those needs in a way and this is the trick that keeps you from going broke um, and so that's mm -hmm. that's the key to it all and never stop buying comics I mean I uh, uh, those days when we actually had to turn down collections I view those as the darkest days in our history because <laughs> yeah. that that was to me the 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 nightmare uh. Yeah, I, I couldn't imagine. I, I couldn't imagine um, not being able to buy comics. I mean, it is not as a store owner, as a collector. You know, it's just um, I mean, because to I, I would imagine a collections coming into your store would be the equivalent of some uh, uh, somebody looking forward to Wednesdays uh, or now Tuesdays, a uh, new comic book day. And it's just you have the opportunity to experience a new comic book day an infinite amount of times it just depends on how many people are willing to walk through there uh, so i mean it's uh that that I, I i understand where you're coming from there for sure i i never stop buying and i i look at it the same way and my my, my little girl she said when are you going to stop doing this and i said i don't i don't think that's ever going to happen i i don't think i can ever stop buying comics this is this well, is what i want to do my comics out of my cold dead fingers Seriously, um, I'm I'm already designing the world's biggest coffin. <laughs> um, the, it's uh, I'm saving up for a pretty big, uh, pretty big plot just because. Um, yeah, you're gonna have to pry them from my cold dead hands. That's, well, that's what's gonna happen. In closing, I'll show you something. Um, Will Moulton bought a collection today, and uh, I collect giveaway comics. And so uh, these are some like this is. Uh, for the Canadian park system. Um, I didn't know they did a Canadian giveaway, but got it now. And uh, this is for recycling, which is, you know, it's 1980s. But uh, wow. this one is really cool because it's got uh, uh, some of the uh, Hanna-Barbera uh, characters in it. And uh, it was printed so that it reads like this. It holds. Oh, man. Stapled at the top rather, or actually it's glued, not even stapled. Um, but it folds up rather than than doing your typical. Um, but uh, these are from my collection, and uh, I own about 2,000 different giveaways. And I used to collect them because um, nobody wanted them in the store, so they 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 were just sitting around. And I said, well, fuck, I I'll collect them. And so uh, now suddenly, uh, uh, Craig Yo has started a Facebook group about giveaway comics. And uh, damn, if 2,000 people didn't sign up overnight. It's like, Jeez. whoa, Nelly, I had no idea that anybody even cared. Um, but, you know, and you notice, too, um, uh, these are not pristine mint, and I don't care because I'm a comic book collector. I'm a comic book reader. Um, I really don't care about condition, which is in this day and age like saying, you know, that, that you know, it's like, like being a total iconoclast because everybody swears by, you know, 9.6 or, or, or hmm. plus. And it's like, who gives this shit? I, mean, I love comics and comic story and graphic storytelling. I don't care. No, I, I'm, I'm so in that same boat with you, Chuck. I know you're an extremely busy man, and I I think I've only uh, touched on about three of the questions, but I'm glad that we got the State of the Union out of you. I really hope that we can get together and do this again, because I know that you're probably, I mean, if not, definitely the most important man still alive in comics, if not the most interesting man on the planet. I've had the, uh, the opportunity to listen to quite a few of your stories, and I know I've just scratched the surface, and I think these stories need to be documented, so I hope that we can get down to that. Um, I want to talk to you more eventually about Betty. I think yeah. uh, no, we can talk I would... about anything. I've always been super candid with people. Um, you ask me a question, you'll get a straight up answer. Um, and so, but um, the big thing is whether your viewers care. What's that? The big question is whether your viewers care. Um, oh, because... um, I, you know, I don't understand. I, I don't. Anybody that doesn't. <laughs> doesn't care after you talk as a viewer that I don't give a shit if I have or don't have well, because well, to me no that that's that's what it comes down to Chuck because uh, that that's the level of respect I have for you and if they don't understand how important you are to this then uh, it's they they're really not listening to me <laughs> and that's no, what it comes down it's to it's okay i don't ever presume that that others will 
uh, appreciate my perspectives because sometimes I come across pretty harsh and I and uh, that turns some people off and I don't I don't mean to do that and I it's just I don't think that there's a lot to be served in the world by sugarcoating things I think that you just say them and if you're wrong and I already have been wrong so many times um, but if you're wrong um, just you know man up just take it uh, it's okay it's, you, you, it's okay to be wrong but the big thing is is that it's like a comic book and this is super important okay I'll, I'll leave you with this thought every comic book in this building failed remember what wow. I said about stores being flowers and only having a period of time that they blossom every comic book in this store and there are some very limited exceptions but even those have drastically altered from their original conception they all died never forget mm -hmm. that every comic book was somebody's dream somebody's greatest cherished hope and it was a form of communication that they put out there but at the end of the day it died so whatever it is that you like you thought Sandman was the greatest comic book that ever existed 75 issues done done mm. it died fables it died okay all those great comics out there that we all love at the end of the day everything dies but and this was Stan Lee's genius and I could go into this for hours but I've just to give you the simple thing Stan Lee said that people vote with their wallets okay if your stories are good if your presentation is good and he was a master of presentation but if your presentation is good then people will support you and that project will go on but remember Stan Lee killed Surfer Silver Surfer with issue 18 in the original run bitch wasn't making money done the Hulk lasted six issues in its original incarnation canceled it done okay Captain America in the Golden Age ran 92 issues it died came back later but initially it was a great idea that outlived the war but not by long and so always remember that we are the guardians of ideas that may have been magnificent at one time um, but time marches on and we need to be sure that we safeguard the legacy and with that I'll let you go and I hope that people respond positively if they do then I'll come back again and I'll give I'll, I'll give you whatever I got you ask a question I'll I'll give it to you they're gonna love it Chuck I know they are um, uh, they, I know I know they are it's uh, no, I'm not losing any listeners over this one. That, that's for sure. I thank you so much for your time. I know how valuable it is. You just came in from feeding the homeless, I imagine. This is what you do. Um, <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank we'll, we'll you be in touch. On. It was very kind, and it's been fun. Good. I'm glad you had fun, Chuck. That's, that's all that matters. We're all just trying to have fun here. All right. Well, you enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Bye.